In Book 12 of Homer's Odyssey, when Odysseus and his sailors leave Circe's island, heading towards the Isle of Thrinacia, their sails billowing under a swift gale, they find themselves suddenly in a stretch of calm water. The wind drops, the heaving swells are mysteriously hushed, the sea's mirrored surface glistens, motionless and dead. Odysseus had been warned of this. His ship was sailing perilously close to the island of the Sirens. In a burst of activity, the sailors stow the sails and set to with their oars, thrashing the water white with violent strokes. With his sword, Odysseus slices a wheel of beeswax, kneads it soft under the hot sun, and plugs his sailors' ears. His men lash him to the mast with ropes, anything not to be lured by the song of those beguiling creatures on the rocks, anything not to fall prey to their enchanting song, their meadow starred with flowers. But carried on the still air, undeniable as the sea and sun, their kaleidoscopic call is heard. Come close, famous Odysseus, Achaea's pride and glory, moor your ship on our coast so you can hear our song. Never has any sailor passed our shores in his black craft until he has heard the honeyed voices pouring from our lips. And once he hears to his heart's content, sails on, a wiser man. We know all that comes to pass on the fertile earth. We know it all. Odysseus gives himself over to the siren song, finding such pleasure in their ravishing voices that the heart inside him throbs to listen longer. He orders his men to loosen the ropes and release him, turning black frowns upon them, every nerve and muscle in his body, every string of his soul, straining to belong to that alluring world forged in music, given shape and form by those seductive lips. Despite his fierce attempts to free himself, his sailors luckily know better. They lash the ropes tighter to the mast and row more furiously still to leave the sirens behind in their wake, to escape what would have been, as Circe foretold, an imminent and watery death. One wonders, after experiencing this delight, how the real world might have changed. Did Ithaca, on his return, seem paler its sunlight a little dimmer for having tasted of that ethereal plain. Odysseus escaped, but what might become of someone who foregoes all warnings, who opens himself up to the terrible beauty of that song? What might become of someone for whom the aesthetic indulgence in those unearthly melodies is more significant than life itself? A few months before his death, the Sicilian writer Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa, author of The Leopard, returned from the coastal town of Augusta to pen the novella The Professor and the Siren, otherwise known by the evocative title of Ligea. I took it with me on a recent trip to Sicily. It was published posthumously in 1961, and the edition I'll be referring to was translated by Stephen Twilling. It's a novella that in some ways answers the question I posed about Odysseus's escape from that ravishing song. The core fantastical narrative involving a precious youthful encounter on the Sicilian coast between a professor of classical literature and a beautiful immortal being is framed by yet another encounter which begins in the northern city of Turin. A young journalist and womanizer, Corbera, frequents a cafe on the Via Po, where he encounters La Chura, the now aged and illustrious professor of classics. Both are Sicilians, both very far from their native island. The description of the cafe in which they meet sets up one of the major concerns of the novella, that is, an exploration of the hierarchies of experiential intensity. The idea that if one has been privy to the extremes of emotional, aesthetic and sensual intensity, 
The question is raised of whether the ordinary world can be said to exist at all. The café is described as a sort of Hades filled with wan shades of lieutenant colonels, magistrates and retired professors. These vain apparitions played checkers or dominoes, submerged in a light that was dimmed during the day by the clouds and the arcade outside, during the evenings by the enormous green shades on the chandeliers. They never raised their voices, afraid that any immoderate sound might upset the fragile fabric of their presence. It was, in short, a most satisfactory limbo. In this description of the café, ideas of the liminal, transient or incorporeal are overtly foregrounded. From the descriptions of the shades and apparitions that haunt its tables, to the explicit references to the dwelling places of the dead, we are placed distinctly on an inferior plane of existence. Our inauspicious setting seems to be fighting a losing battle for its own right to exist. And what might be thought of as real seems very far away indeed. It may be no coincidence that this northern cafe appears so intangible to two Sicilians. Despite the professor having adopted the Piedmontese manner of referring to Sicily as down there, there is an undeniably different mode of description on display when, after they have warmed to one another's company, their native Sicily is the topic of discussion. Corbera describes how they spoke about eternal Sicily, the Sicily of the natural world, about the scent of rosemary on the Nebrodi mountains and the taste of melilli honey, about the swaying cornfields seen from Etna on a windy day in May, the fragrant gusts from the citrus plantations known to sweep down on Palermo during sunset in June. When Sicily is discussed, it has an essence of physicality. Its fragrances and flavors are tangible. Sicily is not transient, but eternal. La Chura confesses a taste for its sea urchins, describing them in lurid, sensual, and bodily detail. He says, they are the most beautiful thing you have down there, bloody and cartilaginous, the very image of the female sex, fragrant with salt and seaweed. They're as dangerous as all gifts from the sea are. The sea offers death as well as immortality. The combination of the carnal and transcendental in the professor's description of the sea urchins foreshadows his account of his meeting with the mermaid. In fact, there are further parallels. Just as the professor scorns Corbera's sexual escapades with local girls, who carry with them, as the professor sees it, a cadaverous stink, because in 50, 60 years, they will die. He makes similar comments about the local sea urchins, remarking, it's a shame they're not from the sea down there, these urchins, that they haven't been steeped in our algae their spines have surely never drawn a drop of divine blood. For La Chura, there is a longing for a return of the once experienced reality, something that only Sicily's sensual transcendence, its tastes and tides can provide. A fondness grows between La Tura and Corbera. They eventually become close enough for the professor to relate a story that gives some context to his mysterious comments on sex, immortality, and transcendence. He invites Corbera to dinner and relates his tale. During the summer of 1887, as a young scholar readying himself to enter a competition to earn a chair of Greek literature at the University of Pavia, he takes the opportunity to study in isolation in a rude dwelling on the beach at Augusta. He lives simply, works endlessly, writes and studies, recites Greek verses to himself with, he thinks, not a soul around to hear him. One pitilessly hot morning, he rows his boat from the shore and comes across the unexpected figure of Ligea. Mi voltai e la vidi. 
il volto liscio di una sedicenne emergeva dal mare, due piccole mani stringevano il fasciame. Quell'adolescente sorrideva, una leggera piega scostava le labbra pallide e lasciava intravedere dei stintini aguzzi e bianchi come quelli dei cani. Non era però uno di quei sorrisi come se ne vedono fra voi altri, sempre imbastarditi da un'espressione accessoria di benevolenza o di ironia, di pietà, crudeltà o quel che sia. Esso esprimeva soltanto se stesso, cioè una quasi bestiale gioia di esistere, una quasi divina letizia. Questo sorriso fu il primo dei sortilegi che agisse su di me, rivelandomi paradisi di dimenticate serenità. Dai disordinati capelli color di sole, l'acqua del mare colava sugli occhi verdi apertissimi, sui lineamenti di infantile purezza. Sotto l'inguine, sotto i glutei, il suo corpo era quello di un pesce, rivestito di minutissime squame madreperlacee e azzurre, e terminava in una coda biforcuta che batteva lenta il fondo della barca. Era una sirena. In the mermaid's depiction, we once again see that coupling of the animal and the spiritual. Her sharp white teeth like dogs, her disordered hair, her bestial delight in existing, and her forwardness are set against images of paradise, serenity, and infantile purity. La Chora even goes on to discuss in their sexual congress the meeting of these two extreme poles of experience. He says, in those embraces, I enjoyed the highest form of spiritual pleasure, along with the greatest physical gratification, devoid of any social resonance, the same that our solitary mountain shepherds experience when they couple with their goats. If the comparison repels you, it's because you're not capable of performing the necessary transposition from the bestial to the superhuman plane, planes that were, in this case, superimposed. In order to make sense of the mermaid, readers have offered various interpretations of the tale, using Todorov's definition of the fable to offer an allegorical reading, Maria Grazia di Paolo views in it an ascent into a world of platonic, perfect ideas. She writes, the mermaid's double nature is emblematic of the perfect synthesis of the sensual and of the spiritual, of the human and of the divine. Lampedusa has taken us from the settings of the cafe in Via Po as mere shadows of our reality, to the purity of perfect ideas of a fantastic past. Demonic versus divine womanhood archetypes have been used to exemplify that journey. For the destructive powers of the women in Corbera's life have been replaced by the life-giving force of Ligea, leading us back in time to the Sicilian gods of old and the alluring pleasures of platonic ideals. Marina Warner, in her wonderful introduction to the New York Review of Books Classics edition, offers yet another allegorical reading, preferring to view in the relationship between the professor and the mermaid a recasting of the writer's love for his native Sicily. She writes, Through the scathing fury of La Chura and his hankering for the past and his fairy love, Lampedusa presents an allegory of his passion for Sicily. The mermaid embodies the island's deep time and her spell, the ecstasy and the wound that its mad beauty inflicts. To see Lampedusa's last completed work as a love letter to his native land, which had occupied so much of his artistic attention, is not surprising. But my own understanding of the tale is slightly different. A love letter it may be, but its recipient is, to my mind, not Sicily, but perhaps the only thing that could compete with it for Lampedusa's affections. Both of the writers whose interpretations I've shared acknowledge that the tale and Ligea herself may be seen as a tapestry woven together from numerous literary sources. Beyond the obvious Homeric parallels to Odysseus and the Sirens, the association between Thrinacia and Sicily, 
there are references to a number of texts that deal with the siren or mermaid myth. When Corbera examines Latura's bookshelf, he finds Fouquet's Undine and Giraudot's play of the same name. In addition, there are the works of H.G. Wells, whose novel The Sea Lady also deals with interactions between a mermaid and humankind. Latura also quotes the opening lines of Shakespeare's sonnet 119, whose first line runs, what potions have I drunk of siren's tears. Further still, there is the siren's name, Ligea, which, in addition to its mythological associations, calls to mind Edgar Allan Poe's tale, Lygia, the titular character of which is a custodian of arcane knowledge, which she imparts to the narrator. Maria Grazia di Paolo also makes note in her essay of Poe's heroine as the possessor of all knowledge. Lygia has traversed all the wide areas of moral, physical, and mathematical science. Her learning is immense. She is deeply proficient in the classical tongues. Undeniably, I hear an echo here of Homer's sirens, who know it all, all that comes to pass on the fertile earth. Beyond all the echoes and allusions to specific texts, however, could it be that Lampedusa's tale is a love letter not to ideal forms or Sicily alone, but to literature itself as it is carried on the breath. The tale of the mermaid is, after all, a spoken one. Its Homeric antecedent also emerges from a distinctly oral tradition. This is nowhere more apparent than in the attention Lampedusa pays to Ligea's voice. Ligea speaks Greek. She introduces herself as Ligea, daughter of Calliope. It is surely worth noting that the ancient Greek Calliope translates literally as beautiful voiced. She is the muse who presides over epic poetry and eloquence and is believed by some to be the particular subject of Homer's invocations in the Iliad and the Odyssey. In a particularly beautiful passage, Lampedusa describes Ligea's voice in detail. Latura calls it, significantly, the greatest of her charms. He writes, She spoke, and thus was I overwhelmed, after her smile and smell, by the third and greatest of her charms, her voice. It was a bit guttural, husky, resounding with countless harmonics. Behind the words could be discerned the sluggish undertow of summer seas, the whisper of receding beach foam, the wind passing over lunar tides. The song of the sirens does not exist. The music that cannot be escaped is their voice alone. For me, the description of Ligea's voice is able to absorb both of the readings offered by Marina Warner and Maria Grazia di Paolo. For instance, just as the planes of bestial and superhuman are superimposed upon one another through sex, Ligea's voice resounds with countless harmonics, encompassing the fundamental or lowest frequency, as well as the upper partials that hover above but are integral to it. It is both the underworld and paradise embodied in song. Folded into this voice is also the hum of the sluggish undertow of summer seas, the receding beach foam on the coasts of Lampedusa's native Sicily. But breath and song are the very origins of literature. And I can't help but feel that Lampedusa had this in mind when he sat down to compose what would be his final work, his final love letter to the art he had cherished. As all things do, that relationship had to end. And so we might also see Lampedusa's tale as a letter of farewell, a farewell which, as Ligea reminds us, must be remembered. Odysseus's escape was perhaps not a permanent one. The siren song has continued to resound throughout literature, and if we give ourselves over to it, as Latura did, rather than trying to escape, we might find that it keeps its promises and offers the wisdom 
that Odysseus forsook. Addio, Sasà, non dimenticherai. Il cavallone si spezzò sullo scoglio, la sirena si buttò nello zampillare rigidato. Non la vidi ricadere, sembrò che si disfacesse nella spuma. Let me know in the comments if you have any favorite works where the myth of the sirens and mermaids continues to resound. I'd love to hear your recommendations. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really means a lot to me. Thanks ever so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.